there's a couple different ways that normally every problem can be solved. So that's one anchor, I think, which is this, you know, belief that you're focused on outcomes. You're not just focused on how you do it, you're focused on what outcome you want, because that will empower people to focus on those outcomes. Hello and welcome to the Remarkable CEO Podcast, a show dedicated to chiropractors who want to transform their job into a business so that they can have a remarkable practice as part of a remarkable life, not instead of one. With your hosts, Dr. Pete Camiolo and Dr. Stephen Franson. Hey, everybody, this is Dr. Stephen Franson for another episode of the Remarkable CEO Podcast. I'm super excited, as always, to join you guys for another awesome episode. Today is going to have a little extra awesome sauce because I've brought in a very good friend of mine, this is Ken Stillwell. It's going to take every cell in my body not to call him Dr. Ken Stillwell, but Ken is the, he's the number two, man. He's the COO of a giant company in Boston called Pega Systems or Pega. Uh, and I've brought him on to have a really critical conversation for all of the recovering control freaks in the room, uh, because as a number two, Ken knows all about what it is to try to come alongside somebody like us and make a system go from a job to a business. Uh, Ken, thanks so much for joining us today, buddy. No, awesome, awesome, Dr. Steven. I'm glad to be here. Happy to uh, to contribute to all your listeners on their journey to, to getting their business to the next level. Man, it's such great insight you're gonna bring here today. You know, you and I have had this conversation already, which is why I invited you to come on board here. Uh, you know, as a Cairo, if I were listening to this without knowing you, I'd be like, wait a minute, I'm trying to build a seven figure business. This guy's running a billion dollar business. How could I possibly glean anything from this other than just general wisdom? So no pressure, Ken. I know you're going to bring general wisdom to this conversation, uh, but you know, I know you're going to share some tactics that, hey, listen, there's things that trans translate across businesses and industries and small business to mid business to huge business, right? So I'd really love to just focus our conversation in here today around exactly what I said. What's it like to come alongside of the recovering control freak, that number one, that entrepreneur who, you know, started off as an owner operator is now trying to become or has recently become the CEO. They're growing up, so to speak. They've made this ascension. They're so used to being the owner operator who has enjoyed a, uh, a certain level of success, some of them wildly successful doing what they do best, which is raw horsepower, rolling up their sleeves, doing everything themselves. Now, as they grow up to become an entrepreneur, I mean, become a CEO, what they recognize is they got to let, so, let, let go of some of those tendencies that made them successful as an owner operator, right? So those control free tendencies, they've got to be able to embrace the creation of systems to create scale. And they've got to build up an awesome team of A players around them that they can trust, that they can delegate to, train and develop, but then just let them go do their job. So that's what we're going to talk about here today. But before we dive in, Ken, tell us just a little bit about yourself. How did you get into uh, uh, this conversation with me? Because it's an awesome background story, guys. I usually don't ask people to tell their chiropractic story, but you got to hear this. You got to know how this guy's got extraordinary insight into what it means to, uh, to run a chiropractic organization, but frankly, how to be a chiropractor. So, uh, yeah. So, uh, so once again, thanks for having me. Um, so my my background is a little is is a little unique uh, because when you see if you if you read my resume and you see what I do you would say so how's this fit into chiropractic um, and so my wife is a chiropractor uh, my father in law is a chiropractor four of his siblings are chiropractors my wife's grandfather was my wife's brother is uh, four people that were in my wedding were chiropractors. <laughs> Um, you know, I, uh, I, I probably would have been one if anybody would have actually put their arm around me and told me to go in that direction because I was always, you know, I, uh, I, I injured myself when I was uh, playing basketball when I was younger, hyperextended my knee and I went to a chiropractor and it was really helpful in the recovery when I was kind of later in my high school years. But I just never really had anybody that I didn't really understand what chiropractic was at that time. Um, I never, I was always a very natural focused person. I've never taken medicine in my life. I mean, like maybe when I was like 10 years old or something, but I've just, it just felt wrong to me. And so I've just, so philosophically, when I met my wife, we were very aligned with just trying to do as much as we possibly can to be, you know, to, to let your body do what it is meant to do. So it's always kind of been kind of part of who I was. 
Um, but I spent a lot of time at Palmer Chiropractic, which is where my wife uh, went to school. And I actually was uh, was traveling a lot for work. So I actually lived there, um, went to classes. I always joke with some of my buddies and say I probably went to more classes than they did. Um, but uh, but I, I, I really got to be immersed in it. And because of that, it's kind of just been part of who, who I've been. Um, my, my father-in-law is a very influential person in my wife's life and actually in mine as well. Um, and he's really a great role model for, I think, how you should be a, a, a patient caring person in any profession. Okay. And so it's really, so my wife, my wife is a, is a chiropractor and, and um, does wellness as well. Um, I am uh, an owner in that business. I would say, you know, mostly by name only, but I am her advisor in terms yeah, no of no uh, governance whatsoever. Yeah, I mean, I can't help myself. You know, I got like, um, and I think that I do help her uh, kind of, you know, think about the decisions uh, that you make along the way. Um, in terms of how that fits in to what I do, so I've been, I've been, um, I always joke that I'll that I'll write a book someday called Being Number Two, you know, and because I've been basically a number two at almost every single company that I've been at since I was, you know, 28 years old. And the thing that's awesome about it is I got to, in almost every one of those, it was actually the entrepreneur or founder of the business. Um, the company that I'm at now, I mean, it's much larger in scale. Amazingly, our CEO is actually, we did found the company he is the longest tenured CEO in a public company right now. And he's been doing it now. He, I think, has released a lot of his micromanagement tendencies over time. But he that's also taken him a lot of years. And I think he would he was probably admit that he's made mistakes along the way. But I think there's a lot of entrepreneurs that I've worked with that were much earlier in their journey um, that were really just the first, you know, I might've been the first person in the company that actually helped them break that pattern right. of always assuming that nobody can do anything as good as they could do it, right? And I think that's a natural, I mean, the beauty of an entrepreneur is that they really are so well-rounded and so skilled and so passionate about what they're doing that they're okay doing everything, right? To the detriment of their family and their outside life a lot of times, right? Because they're just so, so that's the beauty of an entrepreneur. And it's very rare, like you should embrace that. The key is to help. And I think my role is to help entrepreneurs over time unleash the real value that they have, which is the vision, the strategy, the culture of how to get the business to the next level. Because if you don't do that, I think everyone would admit you'll be stuck kind of in a business that becomes more like a job than you want it to be as an entrepreneur. And that's a reason why a lot of entrepreneurs found a company and then they leave and go found another one because they, they can't really, or they don't want to get that company to the next scale. And so they, they kind of have to go and try to do something different. And so my, my role in all of this, I think maybe my, the reason why I'm in business, I think is to maybe be a helpful aid uh, to people that have entrepreneurial tendencies and, and helping them um, really realize the value of getting skilled talent around you and really focusing on what you do well, which normally is not a hundred percent of what, it, what the business needs you to do. So good, man. So just hearing that last two minutes, I hope people would just appreciate that you might be the most extraordinarily uniquely qualified person on the planet to have the con this conversation, right? So the idea of your, you know, uh, a number two running, uh, you know, this isn't your first picnic, right? So money r running multiple multi-million dollar and now multi-billion dollar company as a number two working closely with a person that most of the listeners probably really relate to and relate with, which is that entrepreneur that started the whole thing that's trying to this painful process of breaking away from all those control freak uh, tendencies, those entrepreneurial tendencies that actually got them where they are. And uh, like the old expressions of, uh, is exactly what's keeping them from getting to the next level, right? So, man, you're just a perfect person to do that. If that was the, if that were your only criteria uh, or credentials, but the fact that you are married to a chiropractor, and you know, let's let's tell the truth, you went to Palmer. Right? So yeah. I love the stories, and when you say friends, I'm going to drop names here, right? So, <laughs> friends is not just Dr. Brooke, right? That we love. But, you know, we're, you know, we're talking about Mark Mao. <laughs> we're talking about Eric T. Martina, right? We're, we're talking about this community knows these guys, right? So, you know, we all smile when we, if we just think about you guys as grad school students, you know, hanging around together at chiropractic school. Um, one thing you said to me, just I just smiled when you said, I was at Palmer so much, I was, at, I was on their flag football team. <laughs> it's like, to give you a sense <laughs> of like how much, how much time you had spent there was phenomenal to hear that. And we only say that, and the only reason that's important is because it just gives you such incredibly valuable insight. Like you've seen the entire process, right? So we teach the four seasons of the chiropractic career in the remarkable practice, right? So there's launch, 
build, scale, and exit. And then we, before that, we actually have TRP clubs in school. And then we have a bridge between those two things called next, which means what's next for you. I mean, you've literally been through every single part of this. Uh, so man, you just have a very unique perspective. Uh, so I'm going to pick your brains a little bit. I want to go a little bit deeper on something that you were saying there as far as like, as the number two, you've got to be that person that um, cleaves away some of the responsibilities that a CEO would typically burden themselves with. Like they, the CEO or the owner operator, I should say, really shoulders so much of the responsibility. So we have a really hard time just not getting our hands on, literally as chiropractors, just getting our hands in and on everything, especially when your first three, four, five, 15 years of your career absolutely required that, right? So to really make that leap to go from, you know, being that person who does everything to being that person who systematizes everything, to being that person who trains up, who, who hires A players, invests in training and developing those people. Talk to us about like some of those key things that you've seen that the doctors do, or excuse me, that the owners do successfully in that process. How do you, how do you get them to cleave those things away? How do you get them to identify the things that they should really be focusing on, get into their zone of genius, that type of thing? Sure. So I, and I like using, I like using some, some analogies that kind of help crystallize this. But if you think about, you know, there are, there are world-class athletes that either their skill level or their training, they have a certain way that they do something. And that, that has made them successful. It doesn't mean that that's the way that everybody needs to do something to be successful, right? The reason why if you watch golf or some sport that the same person doesn't win the tournament every single weekend and the people that win it, sometimes they hit it far, sometimes they're good putters, sometimes they're in between. It's because there's lots of ways to win, right? It doesn't always have to be the same way. One of the biggest hurdles that I've found is that entrepreneurs found a way to make their way and they do it the way they view that it's that it's comfortable for them to be successful. And the more that they can break away from that and say, I want an outcome. I don't want it. I don't, and sometimes I don't care how you actually get to that outcome, right? If you want something like, I want to pay a certain number of dollars to be able to get a new patient in the office, there are probably multiple ways to approach that. There probably just isn't one trick. And so with an entrepreneur that maybe did it a certain way, they may have in their mind that that's the only way to do it. And sometimes you have to allow people to think about the outcome that they need to get to and really focus on, well, now let's document that. Let's test it. Let's make sure we have the right KPIs. Let's be transparent transparent and honest, let's measure, let's course correct if we're not getting there. But if you build that kind of culture of, I care about the outcome and I want it to be a repeatable, sustainable process, there's a couple different ways that normally every problem can be solved. So that's one anchor, I think, which is this, you know, belief that you're focused on outcomes. You're not just focused on how you do it, you're focused on what outcome you want, because that will empower people to focus on those outcomes. Another key tenant is ownership and accountability. And sometimes that can be done through incentives and compensation. Sometimes it can be done just by telling people that you trust them and you know that you believe in them and you know that they can get it done. Many times that's all people need to really feel the ownership of like, I'm going to go win, right? So I think that it's very important for the people in your office, the people that are doing different parts of your operation feel ownership, like they're the ones up at night when it doesn't work, not just you. Like that's the kind of, and, and you want them to also be aligned financially to that. So you need to make sure that they feel like they win if the company wins, whatever way that is, could be career, it could be financial, it could just be pride, right? A lot of people are competitive and they want a third anchor, um, a third maybe tenant in that. And this is, this is probably the one I think that is um, maybe the hardest which is get the right people. Because if you, if you do not have people that want the accountability, that want to win, that actually want the repeatable outcome, like they care, they're passionate about it, they may not be as engaged as someone that may be connected to all those pieces. Now, it doesn't mean that every single person in your practice has to be as hard charging as you are as an entrepreneur. That's not, that's not pragmatic. And quite frankly, a lot you of entrepreneurs, to, you don't want entrepreneurs working for you, right? I mean, because they're, they're probably not going to stay with you, but you need to make sure that people are connected to the mission, 
that they actually care. There's lots of things you can do in interviewing, in screening, in training, just in behavioral management. You can make people care, even though they may not have when they started in your practice, you can actually get them excited. So I think that, that, that those are like, if you have the right people that actually feel accountability and ownership to the end result, you're 90% you're of the way there. So beautiful, man. So beautiful. All right, I'm going to tease out because I'm sketching notes down here because, you know, I invited because I wanted to have this conversation. <laughs> I'm just inviting all of you to guys to listen in. <laughs> so, Ken, I loved a couple of things that you said and my the image on, you know, the, the control freak, because, you know, I, I describe myself as a recovering control freak. Uh, and I, you know, I had a black belt in this, you know, so what I am also the systems guy, which is my moniker, right? So I think, which is the nice way of saying I'm a control freak, right? So uh, the OCDDC, right? So I, I am a process pr procedure scripting person, right? It's like, this is how you do it. Now, you know, there's certainly, uh, we encourage people to drift inside the system to, you know, say it the way it's natural for you. Don't be robotic about this, et cetera. But man, I'll tell you what, what you just said there, just my image was it's a tightrope, right? So when you're running an organization, you're trying to create some level of scalability and durability. And, you know, the biggest point of exposure, like inside of a clinic that's trying to scale, for example, and use multiple doctors, you know, any disparity in the patient experience is a big point of exposure, right? So it's like this, this places where you need to know, hold the line, stay on that tightrope. Other times, other places you got to be able to say, what's important is the outcome the, on the other side of it. So such an important conversation. The second thing that you said there on ownership and accountability, I think a bunch of people on the line smiled because one of our big mantras is expectations and agreements, right? So that's what we're talking about here is having, taking ownership. My expectations are this, take ownership of it. And then our, our agreements are, we're gonna have accountability around this. In other words, we're gonna set up reporting systems uh, that give us visibility and meeting rhythms that create accountability, right? So, man, you're just singing our song there. And it's so nice to know that these rules still apply in a billion dollar company. Uh, and then having the right people, man, our four rights are having the right people in the right role, doing the right work the right way. The right people is the first one on purpose, right? So it's like, if you're going to spend money, in our opinion, the best money you can spend, the best ROI, the best investment you can make of your time, energy, focus, and money, is in your people, right? So bringing in the right people, investing in having the right people, training and developing your people, um, man, it does, it comes down to making sure that you're surrounding yourself with the right people or you can never be the CEO. Yeah, and you know, one of the things that you touched on that I didn't mention that's a great point, which is, and we actually do it, we do it here at PEGA, um, and we, we, I would, I always want to say these things. We try to do it right. We're not perfect in any way. Like we struggle. I struggle. I mean, I struggle making sure that I always have a top talent focus and that I'm actually making people accountable and that I'm not bailing them out. And I mean, I even, you know, after I probably will always struggle with that. Right. I don't know that I'll ever have figured it out. The hardest you mentioned, part. you mentioned a point that's, that's really, really important, which is you cannot, you, you, you you have to be careful that the individuals that you put in your organization don't stray from your value system. The value system of the office, the belief system, they don't have to be 100% bought in because sometimes you sometimes people have a job and sometimes they're good at their job and that but they but they cannot be misaligned with the important fundamental tenets of what you're telling your patients, you're telling your customers. And if you believe like I'll give you a great example, if if you if you, if you um, in a company like PEGA, if you value diversity and inclusion because you believe having a diverse workforce represents the communities and the customers that you're in, and you really believe that, and you have managers that don't buy into that, they, 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 have to, they, they have to move on or you have to convert them because it's so fundamentally against right. an important part of your tenant. So I, you know, I think that those, you know, and I'm not, I'm not going to use, I'm sure you guys can think about, or, you know, think about examples of people yeah. that you had in your office that you say, oh, that probably wasn't a good fit, good first view for a patient to see or a good experience. But, but I think it's all about your practice, your office, right? You make the rules, it's your business, right? And you don't have to follow anybody else. So long as they're aligned with your values, you feel like they're not compromising and you're not compromising. And I think that's an important part of it. Okay, let's take a quick break and talk about Cairo Matchmakers. Cairo Matchmakers will help you find the right person for the job. 
If you're looking to hire the ideal chiropractic assistant, Cairo Matchmakers will help you find the specific person missing from your team so that you can get back to using your talents to serve more people. Or if you're looking to hire the ideal associate doctor, CMM can help. Cairo Matchmakers helps chiropractors like you find the ideal associate doctor to unlock your practice potential and get you the freedom that you desire. To learn more, go to chiromatchmakers.com. And now let's jump right back into our conversation. So good, man. So, I mean, you want to figure out what, what business you're going to own. Just turn around and look at your team. Like that's the best predictor of like, what is the, what is the outcome? What's the output of this business going to be? What's the experience for the consumer? What's the environment going to feel like? What's the culture, the look and feel like? It's like, it's going to be your people. Because I mean, we have systems that are used by thousands of doctors around the world and you can walk into a thousand different practices and wow, different experience, different look and feel. So it's as critical as having the right DNA, having the right systems that you're running, et cetera. Man, start with those people, man. Take a look at those people first. So, um, all right. So I'm going to, um, I want to ask you a question very specifically because I know you know the space so well. Um, not only living in it yourself, owning a practice with your wife, watching her grow up, being in the family culture, multiple generations, et cetera, growing up in school with everybody, right? So, you know, the doctors of um, uh, UAC as well. You're in the Ultimate Achievers Club with us. Um, so you're around enough chiropractors, but I want to zoom in. I want to get really specific. I'm going to kind of put you on the spot here. Um, I was going to ask you what advice would you have for Brooke at her level of practice, but I'm not going to do that to you because I know that you got to go home and you're also probably a little too close to the rock face, yeah. but you know, you know, Eric D right. So, you know, Biggie, you know, where he is right now in his business, you know, he's now just his, for the last two years, you've watched how beautifully he's scaled, adding associate doctors seeing that he doesn't have to be the guy that adjusts everybody, making sure that has freed up his doctor wife who wanted to spend more time with their kids at home, right? Brought in his sister-in-law. He's got another young associate doctor that's working in there. He's created an environment where he's making it really easier for these people to be successful as caregivers. And he's just really watched the business flourish. Simultaneously, he's taken his first more than one week vacations in 10 years in the last years. I mean, Next level for Eric. I mean, you know him well. Give him some direction. Like, because his doctors like Eric on the line right now. It's so like, what does next level look like for him? What are some of the things just like you've been on this trajectory in businesses that have gone multiple, multiple seven figures and beyond? What uh, what kind of advice do you give to somebody like a super performer in our space like an Eric? So, so my guess is that lots of people that are successful have traits like Eric. He's super smart. He's very hardworking. He's very committed. He's a process machine, right? He, he normally can figure out pretty much any piece of the business himself. Um, and, and I think that that is one of the reasons why he will always be successful in what he does, which is many of your audience will be in the same. The biggest problem he's going to have is letting go, right? And you just gave some examples of some of the journey and the transformation that I'm sure he's going through, which is figuring out where is the best use of his time. What's the 20 to 30% of the things that go on in the practice that he will excel at? Not only because he's good at it, because he loves it. It's sustainable. That's the other aspect of it. It's not only what you're great at, it's what you love to do. Because then you can do it for the rest of your life and never feel burnout. And then you got to figure out, all right, how do I actually build systems and train people and engage with them? So now they can take the other 70 to 80% of that and do it. Maybe not at the level that he might do it. Maybe, maybe one degree of separation down, quite frankly, maybe one degree of separation better than he does it. Right. But yep. the reality is you got to accept that. And I think that, I think that, that Eric is, you know, sometimes you get to a point where you're successful and you kind of have a, you can kind of pause for a second and say, all right, now how do I get to that next step? And I'm sure as you're building a practice, you don't have time to think about that. You know, you're just trying to make sure like, I got to pay the bills. I got to get the kids, I got to save for college. I got to get my house paid off. I want to make sure that I don't have to live week to week and I want to hire the next doctor. And I want, but once you get to a point where you've kind of done it for a number of years in any business, you can kind of get a little bit more. You can see your yourself a little. You can step out of your body and watch the things that you do and go, gosh, why do I have to, why can't I take a vacation? 
Why am I always the doctor going in in the evenings and on Saturdays? Is this really the way I wanted it to be? Or did I actually do this to myself? And I think that you, you have to really be able to step back. And, I, and I've had lots of conversations with Eric, and I think he's very self-aware yeah. of actually, which a lot of people are not, right? Which is the biggest challenge is to be self-aware and recognize it. Um, and I think, you know, when we were in Park City and we talked, one of the question, one of the comments in, in uh, when I had spoke, one of the comments that he made to me was, he's like, you blew my mind saying that I should only do, I should only be focused on 20% of the business. And like, I should, and I should have somebody else doing 80. And he was almost like, you know, like, wow, like that's, I wasn't thinking about it that way. Have that flip, right? Yeah. That, and, and cause you want to do the 90 and then you have people doing the 10 that you don't want to do. But the reality is you can't scale business like that, right? It's very challenging. So yeah. I, I think that probably most people that are successful, but trying to make that next leap are, have all that work ethic, intelligence, hard work, commitment, great with people, probably employees are loyal to you, right? You have a vision. Now you got to get to the next level. You got to figure out how you turn that, that practice that is only worth something if you're there into something that's worth something, whether you ever come in, right? It's turning into a business. That's right. From a, that's, I think that's all what probably most of the people listening to this are trying to, to take that next step. That's exactly right. So, you know, what we teach inside of this system is, you know, it's really a trifecta to go from having a remarkable practice to having a remarkable business. There's a trifecta that you got to link together, right? So the first is the obvious one, which is bringing in the remarkable associate doctor, right? So it's like, okay, I got to either bring one in or I've got to really invest in bringing my mine up, right? So most of them are just not managed properly. They don't understand how to, how to lead an associate doctor, how to optimize it. Their expectations are sideways. They don't really think through what, you know, the difference between a business builder and a caregiver, like that's a different conversation for a different day. But I think that's the obvious one. Most of them is like, if I could just get one or two or three really high performing associate doctors, then I'm scalable. It's like not so fast. They're a critical part, part of the equation, but that, you know, that third part, so there's you as the CEO, there's the remarkable associate doctor, there's the office manager to remarkable COO is the mm -hmm. third piece, the third leg of that trifecta. And man, just like you went through this ascension as an owner operator into the CEO doc, you've got to make this ascension for your, for your office managers as, as well, right? So maybe they started out as a checkout CA, then they became the back office or business office manager. Then they became the office manager because they took on responsibility for running the team. Now you have to make the ascension from office manager to COO and let them run the business. So Kenny, that's what you do, man. So I, this is your opportunity to think back about all the things that all of the number ones have been, you know, they, that drive you crazy over the years and be like, advise these number ones that are listening right now. It's like, guys, as the COO, I'm turning and telling you, like, start doing this and stop doing that. How do we optimize somebody like you who's just so critically important to just the success of the business, the growth of the business, but also getting the doctor to the place where they can have a remarkable practice as part of a remarkable life and not instead of one. How do we optimize you? So I think the, uh, a, a, couple, um, a couple things that come to mind uh, through the years, um, one, um, one particular CEO that I worked for a number of years ago, and he was, he's, he's, he and I have, you know, still kept in touch over the years. Um, and interestingly enough, he actually lives in Park City now. Um, he's, uh, he, um, he told me once that his biggest issue was um, trust. And I said, geez, like you really don't trust people to, you know, he said, no, no, it's not that I don't trust people. I don't trust people's decisions. I don't trust people's ability to make a decision at the quality that I think I can make a decision. And I said, and do you think that you've had good people around you and you still feel that way? And he said, I do. And I said, so you know what you need to do is you, you need to actually let people make those decisions, but give them a framework in which they need to make those decisions. Now you could call that a system. You could call that a KPI, a goal, a, you know, a, an objective. Give them what it is that you want them to do and maybe some boundaries on how you want them to do it, right? And you want new patients brought in, but there's a, you know, there's a certain amount of cost and there's a certain type of patient and there's a certain style in which you would market to bring those patients in, right? And, and then watch them and coach them, teach them, tell them not how you would do it, but why you think maybe some of the steps that they're making may not be aligned with the process. And then commit to the process evolving. 
because maybe the process isn't perfect. And what's happening is what they're learning and what you thought worked, there might be a kind of a merge of those two that might make it more optimal. So the first thing I would say is commit to mentoring, commit to teaching, commit to monitoring and measuring, but let them do it. Don't, don't manage mentor because you'll be amazed at what people can do if you give them an opportunity. The next thing that I think is that I would say is a, another di a different a different CEO that I worked with. Um, I would say, you know, be consistent, right? The worst thing that can possibly happen is is what 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 I call, you know, the the whack a mole CEO, right? If you know, remember that game in the video, oh, yeah. right? And there's CEOs that literally they don't know what they care about until that day, and they care about things that to an outsider, it looks very scattered. Like no one can figure out why you care about why the light bulb is out in the, in the waiting room versus why the, you know, the, the, you know, a patient is taking too long, a doctor's taking too long with a patient. People can't figure it out and it feels random. And so therefore they think the processes are random and then they get confused and they're less effective. So I would say CEOs can really damage an organization if they come in and they basically just scatter all over the place and criticize things because they probably have a reason why they're criticizing, right. but they have to be, they have to articulate that. Be, the whole backstory and that person receiving it is only getting 5% of that, right? So exactly. to to explain it, once again, coaching and mentoring, best thing a CEO can do is coach and mentor. And then there's another, there's another example I can think of, of a, of a CEO. This is very early in my career where the CEO wasn't on top of the detail. So that what the CEO did was set a vision, assumed that everybody was doing it, but didn't have measurements, didn't have the KPIs, weren't, didn't have the transparent discussions, didn't have the checkpoints every week, every two weeks, every month on how the practice was doing, how the business was doing, and then things just popped up. And by the time they popped up, the problem had seeped way through the system. And it was really like almost a uh, almost a, a transformational kind of, oh, we got to fix this now. We've got somebody stealing money from the company, or we've got somebody that completely had a bad experience with hundreds of patients, and we didn't even know it because we never asked patients who didn't come back why they're not coming back or whatever the thing. So you've got to make sure because if you're, if you're going to step out as a CEO, which is a beautiful transformation, you have to make sure that you've anchored in enough of the operating systems that you can actually measure what's going on. By the way, sometimes you can do that in one hour a month, right? right. If you do it right, I mean, that might, it might actually be that you might be capable of doing that, but right. don't step away and stop paying attention to the way the business is running. Because if you do that, the business will take on a life of its own. And that may or may not be the outcome that you want. So I love this. And, you know, we, we talk a lot about having reporting um, systems and meeting rhythms, right? So it's that reporting system where the doctor can just glance at a report and sit down in a meeting rhythm with the appropriate person. Now they've got the visibility and the accountability and the efficiency of it. So the CEO can do what we do best, which is assess, then plan, prepare, and execute, right? So uh, the other key to that being done well is having a person like yourself and number two, who can be in the weeds, hands in, they're the one like they're there. It's almost like they're the bridge between you and the rest of the organization. And if you, you know, you get like what they call in traction, the same page, if you get on the same page with your COO, CEO, CEO, that dynamic, that relationship is so powerful. You can stay out of the weeds with the team and the, in the, in the day-to-day -day operations, and you can get back to, you know, stop running the business, start leading the business. Right. So I think it's a big part of it. Um, a couple of things that I pulled out of that, Ken, I loved the expression, don't manage mentor. So uh, that's fantastic. We all need to hear that. That is, I mean, that that's like the, you know, one of the, the key tactics for, or philosophies, I should say, for getting getting on the other side of that control, um, that need to feel control. So not stop micromanaging, start being a mentor and a leader. Um, be consistent, right? So, uh, so I'm sure the docs are listening right now that probably feel convicted on that is like, Man, if you don't have processes and procedures defined, if you haven't put together goals and you know put up accountability around who's supposed to do what to achieve those goals and set up those expectations and agreements, next thing you know, you're just running around pain solving and firefighting all the time. And some of the things most people didn't even see as fires and you're jumping in all over the place and then you're shifting everybody's energy. So as a CEO, our job is to marshal the time, energy, focus and money of the organization 
and it's based on what we say is important. This is what's important now, and this is what's important next. So that CEO's job is the WIN, what's important now. Don't move the goalposts on everybody. Don't be erratic and be all over the place, man. That was gold, Kenny. Uh, and then the last thing is I think a lot of Kairos are super guilty of this. The other end of the spectrum, really high level and everything's up in our heads, but we don't articulate that vision to the team. We don't stay engaged and involved. We don't have these mechanisms in place that you know keep us honest and keep us connected to the organization, cast the vision. And then we, we go and we just start adjusting people and we think that everything's going to be a-okay. Uh, because you got this, I'm going to do my job, you do your job. And then at the end of the month, the end of the quarter, you know, we're, uh, we're a house on fire because things didn't quite go the way <laughs> we had, we had hoped they'd go. Yeah. So um, <clears throat> there was a doctor uh, at, uh, I think it was at Lyceum one year, I was talking to one of the doctors that came back to speak. And uh, this is when, uh, when my wife was at Palmer and, um, and I was having, it was a conversation. He was having a conversation about um, the example was, so, and I, I'm not sure if it was him or maybe it was just a colleague of his where the doctor said, I'm seeing 400 patients a week, all is good. And somebody asked the question, well, well how, what's your average revenue per patient? And he said, well, I don't know, but I know I'm seeing 400 patients a week. That's gotta be good, right? He said, well, and they turned out that like a hundred of his patients were no bill, were no charges or whatever, right? So you end up with this scenario. Now, maybe that's part of your strategy. That's okay if it is, but you should have that part of your strategy, right? You should know, you should measure because maybe you expected, you know, it to be whatever dollar and it's not, or, or maybe you're trying to actually do a different type of practice or what. So it was just an interesting, you know, that was one. My wife, her first job went to work for a doctor in, uh, in Rockville, Maryland. And um, you'll love this. And I, I, even to this day, I'm like, I have a hard time even processing how successful he would have otherwise been. And she, um, she, she was pregnant with our first child and she didn't want to, she was later, she was, you know, as a first child, you know, she was, she didn't know what to expect with a pregnancy. She was in like, I think month six or month seven, and she wanted to stop adjusting, but she didn't want to stop working. And the doctor said, I'll tell you what, he said, would you mind trying to figure out this whole insurance reimbursement thing, because I have a lot of stuff I don't think I'm collecting and I'm not sure if my office manager, it, just, it would be really helpful. So she went and looked and he had a million dollars of unpaid over like four years from insurance. Like, and she literally spent like, she was like, it was ridiculous. Like, you know, how sloppy everything was. But in his mind, he was doing fine. He was drawing money out of the business. He was seeing lots of patients, but he was just, it was completely inefficient, wrong. Pay, you know, God only knows he could have had issues. You know, he could have had issues with insurance fraud, all kinds of things when he was, and she, it was just an amazing thing. And he was a super smart guy, amazing. Yep chiropractor, great business person. And you see that and you're like, wow, even the people that really have it together may miss, may look a different way or miss something. So I, I think we all have those tendencies. Um, you know, just like we talked about micromanaging and over-focusing on the detail and trying to force everybody to do, some, do something a certain way. There's people that like to live in the high level, right? That's their style. That's their personality. That's okay. Either way, you've got to have someone anchoring you, right? And that's where your COO or your the, the evolution of your office manager into a COO can really give you the opportunity to have someone making sure that all the blocking and tackling is getting done. And the funny thing is, at the company our size, we have now lots of mini COOs across the company because as we get scale, you have to go find who's the COO for the marketing department. Who's the COO for the, you know, when we've got, you know, we've got, uh, you know, 400 people in our marketing department, that is an organization in and of itself, right? You need a COO just for that org. So you end up creating lots of mini COOs as a company scales. And that's, that is totally natural. And that way you've got more and more eyes on making sure that the business is being executed. So good, man. So good. I love the idea of like, you always need an operator. Like, you know, on, we run such small businesses relative to the monster you have, but you need to be thinking about it as, as departments and maybe these are directors, right? So you've got new business development, which is attraction and conversion of new patients. You've got operations, which is the delivery of healthcare. You've got your HR, which is your team, right? So it's hiring, firing, scheduling and all that, you know, and then you've got your admin and the finance money, right? So it's like this really six primary functions of the chiropractic business. You need to have an operator running each one of those arms, 
you know, chiropractors, we love, we love to be visionaries and we love to hang around with other visionaries, but the operators like you, man, are just worth your weight in gold. So just, uh, I'm sure on behalf of all the businesses you've worked for, all the CEOs that you've worked alongside, man, it's, we just thank you guys because, you know, you're the yin to the yang, right? So this is such an important dynamic. There's such a healthy tension in these two roles. You have to have that person next to you who is your complement in your style and your personality. If you're the visionary, you need somebody who's more of an integrator, right? So if you're like, like uh, Gino Wickman teaches in traction, if you're that CEO who's really high level, you need to have a hardcore operator alongside you and vice versa, right? So you've, you've got to have this yin yang complement uh, relationship. So Kenny Stillwell from Pegasus Systems, man, uh, you're the number one in the number two business as far as I'm concerned, brother. Uh, I just love you, bro. Uh, I, I love our friendship. I love the fact that we've got somebody like you in chiropractic. And uh, we really value your insight and having access to a guy like you is a real blessing, man. Hey, I appreciate it, man. And I, you know, I think it's awesome that, that, that you guys have built a network of helping people be successful, right? Using their passion to really run good businesses. So not only can they be rewarded for everything that they're putting in, but also they can reward others, their employees and the doctors that they bring in. So it's awesome, man. Like we, you know, we all need to work together as a community to try to help each other out. Huge. Thanks, man. God bless. All right, everybody. Have a great week, everyone. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Remarkable CEO Podcast. Remember, what the world needs now is chiropractic. And what chiropractic needs now is more successful chiropractors. If you like this podcast, please subscribe, share with a friend, and leave us a review. And if you'd like to connect with us personally, direct message us on Facebook, LinkedIn, or Instagram. Now go and be remarkable. Remarkable.